Hello, my name is uh, Paul Gilbert, and I'm president of the Compassionate Mind Foundation. And this is uh, an interview for creating a Compassionate World series. And I'm absolutely delighted today to talk to my colleague, Dr. Alan Watkins, who is well known for his work in leadership. And leadership is something that we really need today, don't we? So let me just tell you a little bit about him. So um, Alan was uh, originally trained as a medical doctor at Imperial College in London. Uh, he worked for 11 years in the UK's National Health Service in primary care and then went to Australia. And for a year, in, he worked in the academic medical research in the USA as well. He then moved into neuroscience research before leaving medicine to work with global business leaders. Today, he is recognized as an international expert on leadership and human performance. And over the years, he's acquired a broad mix of commercial, academic, scientific and technical abilities. Over the last past 24 years, he has been a coach to many top business leaders and worked with the GP Olympic squad coaches and athletes prior to London 212 and Rio 216. He's uh, written 11 books and that we were just talking earlier and tells me his most recent book has just been published is called Reinventing Education Beyond the Knowledge Economy. So it's a great delight to talk to uh, Alan um, about all kinds of things really to do with leadership and other things. But to, we're going to start just to ask Alan, what, what got you interested in leadership and compassion and being helpful to the world in general? Um, four things, uh, really four, and, and it's lovely to talk to you too. Um, first of all, the example of my mum. My mum was an incredibly compassionate individual. And so as a child, the youngest of four growing up, um, I remember some early experiences. Uh, she worked with uh, people with um, profound uh, uh, brain injury and learning difficulties. And she took me there sometimes to this unit where she worked. And I just saw her being incredibly compassionate. I mean, I didn't know it was that. I was just a kid of seven or eight years old. Uh, but I just picked that up from her. So there was that. And then when I was a med student, uh, I was a practicing Buddhist for a while. Um, so that also tuned me into the importance of compassion. Uh, and then growing up in a, in a family which was pretty dysfunctional. Um, and so I often say to people, I could play pain trop, top trumps, you know, <laughs> having gone through my life, there aren't many things that you list the terrible things that could happen to anybody. I, I can sort of play snap with you on any of those things. So I think you know, having to, you know, struggle with the, the pain and suffering of life caused me to reflect very deeply. Uh, you know, I sort of discovered compassion for self and others as, as a way of handling that. And then, of course, training as a doctor, you know, noodling on the difference between care, of which there is a lot in the uh, health system, uh, but less compassion. So care definitely exists, or even understanding the distinction between care and compassion. So I think that's kind of what kind of tuned me in from a fairly early age, that this was a compassion, a really critical thing uh, that all human beings need to understand. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, you, it's a good point you make this distinction between care and compassion. I mean, what's your, what would you see as the key differences between those two things? Um, I think, as you know, uh, understanding the cause of the suffering. So just not the alleviation of symptoms. As doctors, we're often trained to do symptom removal, you know, take away the pain, which is a caring thing to do, and, and not think too deeply about the underlying causes of that pain. Uh, in a medical sense, you might go to what's the condition that's causing those symptoms, but we don't tend to go beyond that, like, okay, so what caused the condition? Like, uh, but I think uh, my understanding of compassion is you've got to keep digging and keep digging. You know, what's the real root cause of all of this? Yeah. I mean, why is it, for example, if you suffer from heart disease, um, you know, do we just buy the, you know, medical narrative that it's all to do with smoking and family history and, you know, the, the risk factors such as they are? Or do we dig a bit deeper and realise that there are many other factors that aren't spoken about uh, by the medical profession? For example, loneliness, um poor educational attainment um social isolation um all of these other things so uh for me compassion is really digging into that uh it's a much more profound thing than just caring 
Yeah, so the I think it's a wonderful point you make, the, the multi-dimensional nature of suffering, really, it's so many factors that contribute to it, and also because, you know, many animals care for their offspring, of course they do, but humans have these amazing competencies for empathy and thinking and reasoning and planning ahead and anticipating, so, so that's important, and um, you, you, move out of medicine and then you gradually shift it well say you moved out of medicine I know you do a lot of amazing things like you're developing apps with HRV and how to do uh, th think about how to help your your own mind function better and we can talk about that a little later maybe but um then you got into leadership so what interests you in getting into the study of leadership moving from medicine to leadership that's quite a big step really isn't it yeah yeah really it it, from the outside, it looks like a bigger step than it really was for me experiencing it. Uh, and it really came from a, a few things. I realized that when I was a consultant on the ward, uh, I only had 200 people I could help. I'd have 50 patients on the ward and 150 in outpatients. So only 200 souls to, um, to try and help. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll try uh, going into uh, general practice. And I was a GP on the Barrier Reef for a year. Uh, mm -hmm. Terrible. Tough gig, right? <laughs> I actually literally lived on a beautiful house on the beach. Wow. My walk to work was along the beach and into the marina. That was, you know, as a young man, uh, that was pretty gorgeous. But um, as a GP, an average GP has 2,000 people, but you learn fairly quickly that uh, 1,800 are healthy. You don't see them. So you only see the 200 again, and it's the same 200 over and over. So as a sort of doctor in the modern health service you can't get past 200 and so one of the reasons for leaving was I for me personally it was always about reducing human suffering at scale um, and also trying to get upstream um, because as you know medical practice you spend about um, uh, I think 60 percent of all the uh, money that you spend or 80 percent whatever it is a big amount in the last six months of your life um, so, you know, medicine fights to the tooth and nail right at the last moment. And that always struck me, surely we want to get upstream and try and prevent some of that damage happening. So I wanted to work at scale. I wanted to get upstream. Um, and also one of my four sons was diagnosed with autism. And so my academic salary couldn't pay for his treatment. So those three things sort of, you know, came to a head. And, and then after sort of 11, 12 years in medicine, uh, I basically just quit and think, well, if I move to industry, so I mean, we currently work with 100 multinational corporations. Some of these corporations have got 300,000 employees. So you improve the quality of leadership, you could directly affect 300,000 employees. If you include the families, you know, one, one and a half, two million people, if you include the supply chain, it's five million where the ripples out from better leadership so i took the view that bad leadership causes suffering uh, good leadership you know reduces the amount of suffering that bad leaders create so if we can impact leaders in all these companies we can maybe have a bigger scale effect and and try and reduce suffering so there's the relationship between what i'm doing now and when i was a doctor it was still the reduction of human suffering but at scale, and we do that by trying to help these leaders to wake up and grow. So that's fascinating. So in fact, the this is what I think is so important, what you do, it's the same driver, it's a compassionate driver, isn't it? The, the, the prevention of suffering, the identification of the prevention of suffering, particularly in areas where bad leaders cause it. Uh, yeah. it's really about that, isn't it? So it's not all about, you know, efficiency and... and, uh, oh. and yeah. We're on, we're on this other agenda going sometimes it's very interesting is you have to work on the stuff that they think is important yeah, yeah. create some sense of legit of course many of these people are so financially obsessed which is part yeah. of all of their suffering um is you've got to try and help them with the stuff that they think are important build that relationship and then hopefully over time start to help them to wake up to a, a broader agenda that it's not just about money and finances and quarterly performance returns you know they have a responsibility as leaders of big systems transnational systems uh, to you know, lift their people essentially um, and so we hopefully help them to wake up to that and then bring some things in that you can do to improve people's experience 
Yeah, so I mean, that's really, really important because, you know, we came through the last three or 400 years of capitalism industrializations where basically workers were not really regarded as you have to worry about their uh, physical health, let alone mental health. I mean, they were there to make money and, you know, the dark satanic mills of Engels and all that. So it's a really important point you're making that over the last century, maybe the last 50 years, leaders have become more aware. They have responsibilities to providing quality environments for the people that work for them. And I think the point that you're making is such an important one. But still, uh, many leaders have their sort of 19th, 18th century view that workers are just there to make money, to do the job, make money. Um, so, I mean, how have you got on with that? I mean, how have leaders been receptive to your message that you do have a responsibility for the well-being of the people that work for you? How have they uh, been receptive to that message? Uh, it's improving. I mean, when I started, uh, it was almost zero. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so but it's it's getting better as you know people's understanding of the complexity of the world, and I think uh, the pandemic helped. But uh, um, there's an awareness, increasing awareness that actually uh, they do have a responsibility, and it's not all about the money. In fact, the ex-governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, wrote a book recently called Value brackets S, and basically he was saying that him as a hard-bitten capitalist. Yeah, maybe I slightly overcooked the focus on financial value at the expense of social. So you've got people like Mark uh, and and others who are starting to wake up to you know money can't buy your happiness, obviously you know, but go well actually we capitalism probably got the balance wrong. So it's getting a little bit easier, uh, Paul. But the start point is you've got you know twenty, thirty, forty years in many people's careers where the entire focus is about, you know, shareholder return and money and finances. Uh, but it is changing. I mean, one of the things that we do is we've been measuring human motivation uh, and what's called value systems for, you know, best part of 18 years. And um, when we started, 60% um, of all the leaders that we assessed came from a profit motive and only 9% came from a people motive. And last year, those numbers were 29% and 27%. So wow. it's, it's converging. So things are getting better, but it's still, I mean, it's, it's not for the faint-hearted, Paul, the work, work that we do. And it, it is tough, you know, going in and talking to people to try and help them wake up to an agenda beyond the financial, you know, a more human, a more compassionate agenda. It's still tough work. It's, yes, it's very uh, tough work. And the, we, we find that the younger ones, the, the ones under 45, they often have a more of a mission that they want to make money. Of course they do, but they also want to contribute to humanity rather than, you know, but it's, it tends to be the younger ones. I'm not sure if that's what you find as well. There's a slight effect of age, but it's really more to do with maturity, which maybe we'll come on to. Yeah. Age is a relatively blunt proxy for maturity so that's you know if if younger people have woken up to the fact and, and often because they've seen their parents you know chase money and it hasn't made their lives that much better uh you know st you know stockpile a big pension fund or a lot of cash and then they see their parents be a bit miserable and not really enjoying their life and working too hard and all of these things so you know, if that's been their experience uh, as you know young adults, uh, some of those may have waken, woken up to the fact that there's a bit more to life than just that. So in which case, they're, they're more as you describe. Um, you know, others are, you know, brainwashed into the same system that they're yeah. having. So it's some and some. So the, the critical difference, which is somewhat age-related, but not entirely, is waking up to a wider agenda than just money yeah that's a that's, that's such an important point you make and how maybe in various places around the world people are waking up to the idea that we do need a more compassionate orientation to our world to climate all that you know to social justice and that is rippling through into business and i think you've made this point many times that it's not either or i mean the point is if you your uh people that work for you feel well supported 
uh, their mental health is looked after, then they're going to go the extra mile for you. They're going to be more creative for you. They're going to have more loyalty to the to the firm, and so on and so on. So these are these are really important things and helps people to see that you know looking after the people that work for you is not at the expense of then you're going to not make profits and go out of business. There's no point in that, really, is it? Um, but in fact, quite the opposite. If you look at other people, they perform better. I mean, happy people perform better. Yeah. You know, so you, you should do it. I mean, even if you're just the most hard bitten capitalist money grabber, you should do it for those. They will actually make more money for you. Uh, but you should do it because it's the right thing to do. And I think people spend so much time at work. We should enjoy work. It shouldn't be a slog. It shouldn't be, you know, uh, you know, brown beaten and oh, just trying to get through. Um, so I'm all for, you know, better leaders understand that and try and create that environment, but they often need help to know how to be more compassionate, um, because they've themselves grown up in a system which privileges finances over people. Um, and so sometimes we're trying to help them understand it's not an either or, um, it's, you know, you, you can be compassionate and still take care of business. Yeah. And it's not just the money, is it? It's also the concept of the macho image. Yeah. You know, you see this in the stock market, you know, the ability to make money, in, to work 18 hours a day, never take a holiday. Uh, and of course, then you end up burnt out and uh, an alcoholic. Uh, and that's another issue, isn't it? That there is this macho, macho view within some industries that you're supposed to be putting in the, all the hours and, you know, getting all the results and helping people to be treat themselves more compassionately, I think, not, you know, not, not just throwing themselves at the war in order to <laughs> prove how wonderful they are. I think, that, I think that's right, Paul. And again, the macho-ness is a sign of immaturity. Uh, you know, as, you know, you and I are getting slightly uh, older in years, you know, slightly less macho than we may have been as 18-year-old men. Um, so as we mature, that macho-ness starts to subside and you start to see more subtlety and more nuance uh, in the world. So I think partly that's uh, helpful. And I think I have to say that the uh, escalation of uh, technology and artificial intelligence uh, also helps in that, um, you know, just working harder um, doesn't actually solve the problems necessarily is one of the things I think the lesson from AI is you need quality answers not least because if you're going to get paid in your job, you've got to outperform chat GBT. So we've seen in the medical profession, the legal profession, the accounting, all the basic knowledge and you know, really hours put in to get to answers. Well, chat GBT can do it in five minutes. So you need quality. And so that realization, dawning realization is we've got to be smarter, not harder, is helpful, I think, in waking people up to you know, being smart, being compassionate towards yourself and taking better care of yourself, better care of your staff. That's why, you know, the tide is turning. The question really is, is it going to turn quick enough to save ourselves? But definitely I see the tide turning uh, over, over the last particularly five years. Yeah, I think that's true because the trouble with all that macho culture is it also breeds impulsivity and then people make impulsive decisions and they're very bad decisions another aspect i i wonder what you think about is that there's a gradual increasing of uh, women in industry and women leaders it's obviously long overdue and nowhere anywhere near enough but do you think that's had an impact of, of moving this slightly into a more uh caring orientation i think it has and i'm a massive supporter of that and, and, and gender parity uh, I mean, there's quite a good argument for many of the, the problems in the world are driven by testosterone uh, or excessive maleness and macho-ness, as you describe. Uh, most of the murders, most of the crime, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, could we put at the you know more male-driven problem? And so, society and, and male immature macho-ness is part of that whole narrative, um, and. You know, it was interesting in writing the book on education is if you look at uh, how do men grow up, um, a lot of uh, boys, you know, grow up in single parent households. They don't have the father figure around. Um, and then they go to school from primary school up and through to secondary school. Many don't meet a male teacher. Um, you know, they're socialized at home, 
by a mother, a single parent mother, um, and they don't meet uh, a male teacher. So they don't have really good male role models. Um, you know, we have sports jock and the macho, you know, you're fired kind of Alan Sugar type character. Um, so a lot of boys grow up with a very dysfunctional view of what proper manhood looks like. And that's partly the problem, I think. Um, and so if we can help boys to, you know, grow up um, and develop particularly their emotional skills earlier. I mean, as you know, boys are socialized to suppress, repress or deny their own emotions. Whereas for uh, girls, it's a bit more socially acceptable to talk about feelings and boys aren't allowed to. So there's all these sort of currents which are kind of sustaining the slower progress than we need. Yeah, I mean, you, I'm sure you know the book, David Gilmore's The Making of Manhood and how different cultures. And of course, the problem with capitalistic cultures, it, it wants its uh, guys to basically be factory fodder or army fodder. You know, they have to sacrifice themselves for the cause of them and so on and so on. And so they are constantly being stimulated with this idea. If you look at what's happened in the in the, in the movie industry, you know, there's a lot of male on male violence where the, the, the bad guys do very bad things. And then in comes Schwarzenegger or James Bond or somebody. And there's terrible, terrible uh, um, role models, I think, for what it is to be to be a, a man, which yeah. is propagated by the entertainment industry. Yeah. Because they're selling uh, products to uh, you know to get people to come and watch their movies or whatever it is, but a lot of it is all male on male aggression, male on male competition, uh, which is again extremely unhelpful. Yeah, unhelpful, and also it always makes me smile when you look at the the sci-fi. You know, you've got these people, and you look at the you know we've got these spacecrafts that can you know go into hyperspace and you know go billions of light years in ten seconds. Um, and they, the male on male violence still exists. It's, it's like this <laughs> massive acceleration in technology, but humans are still struggling the same old nonsense, you know, that we've been struggling. It's like, wow, all of this acceleration of futurology on the tech, nothing on the human being. Yeah, yeah. Whereas it would be lovely to see future, you know, the reason they don't make that, it may, may not have enough jeopardy and end entertainment value. If you saw, you know, future beings, whether they're, you know, uh, humanoid or not, being incredibly compassionate towards each other and the consequences of that would be make for quite an interesting film. You know, what would be the, the outcome of that? Whereas, the, you know, the alien movies, it's some terrible alien aggressor against the guy with the machine. You know, so even in futurology in the entertainment industry, uh, we still perpetuate that aggressive, uh, you know, narrative of the way to solve a problem is to shoot somebody. Yeah, or to have a superpower, or to be whatever. So yeah. I think it's that, that's it, this narrative in the West, and I think it's got worse uh, over the last twenty years. And certainly, a lot of the these movies now are a little bit more sadistic. Well, I say a little bit. Some of them are very sadistic. You know, the, the more that you make the bad guys suffer. Uh, at the end, uh, the better. Uh, and that worries me a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, it also has an impact on how we perceive the world, that the other, you know, people in the other tribe, the other group, you know, the only way you deal with them is to get rid of them or to exterminate them or whatever. And we've seen that basic psychology all over the world. Um, so what do we do with leaders that want to perpetuate that in reality? They do want to exterminate the other tribe. They do think that's the way in which they're going to protect themselves and stay in power. I mean, those are leaders that are terribly dangerous to humanity. Yes, and, and one of the 11 books I wrote, uh, and this came uh, really quite often, the books I write, Paul, are, I get a bit irritated by something and I end up writing a book. So this was you know, looking at you know, a, a number of um, fairly obvious uh, figures, you might better guess who they are, either in the UK or the US, political leaders look down the barrel of a camera and lie, bold-faced lying with no shame. I mean, the ability to do that. So I wrote this book called Lie Ability, you know, because they have this incredible ability to lie uh, and it makes them a liability in my view. Um, and, you know, I, I wrote about, you know, the nature of truth and the three types of truth um, and the seven deadly art of deception, like if you see a leader doing this. And I also wrote about the lies in business. And one of the 
seven lives in business is we've got to kill the competition. And that's just not true. Um, it, it's a thing that business tells itself. I want to kill the competition in this sort of excessive hostility. But if you look at the evolution of living things, um, even bacteria, as you know, in evolutionary biology, two great leaps forward in evolutionary biology, uh, bacteria had the planet themselves for a billion years. And after a billion years, bacteria realized hmm, it's actually more energy efficient to collaborate than to kill each other. So these single cell bacteria started to share some cytoplasmic DNA. They put it in a library that became the nucleus. So the first leap forward in evolutionary biology was nucleation. Uh, and then after that, they all started killing each other. These sort of single cell bacteria with a nucleus started killing each other again. Second billion years before the penny dropped for a second time, didn't we discover it's more energy efficient to collaborate than to... And of course, the second collaboration uh, was, you know, cells started to fuse and collaborate more intimately and multicellular organisms were born. So the two great leaps in evolutionary biology, nucleation and multicellular, they're both driven by the same thing, which is collaboration. And of course, once multicellular organisms start to happen at five minutes of midnight, humanity arises. So, you know, actually the evolution of things is driven by the collaborative imperative. And of course, what's interesting about that is human beings um, by cell volume, 90% of all the cells in our body, uh, Paul, are bacteria. You know, we're only 10% human and DNA wise, we're only 1% human DNA and 99% bacterial. So at a DNA level and at a cell level, we are we're basically bacteria in a human coat. So at the core of who we are is collaboration. Uh, you know, we're social animals, as you know, we're going right back to John Bowlby. We need love as much as we need food, water and shelter. So it's who we are. So to be excessively competitive, which is what you see in business, goes against our own DNA, goes against our own nature. And so, you know, as more people wake up, we are social animals. We're collaborative by nature and that we need compassion. It's I often say that the. The interpersonal domain, what we call the we space, is the final frontier, co op to Star Trek metaphor, is the final frontier for humanity. We've got to get much better um, at collaborating. And we still see, you know, lots of international violence around the world. Uh, we're not good enough yet, 50% uh, divorce rate in many companies. So we've still got a lot to learn about how do we interact and collaborate and how do we become more pro social and more compassionate. There's still quite a journey to be done there, I think. Very, um, yes, very much so. And um, you've had some thoughts about that but in your book, Crowdocracy and Things. And uh, so maybe we can have a look at that in a moment. But I think one of the other issues is the importance of the rule of law. I mean, in 1945, the United Nations had some fantastic charter of human rights and so forth, but um, they have not been able to instigate the rule of law. So country after country after country have simply ignored the rule of the law. They've done whatever they want. And we've got places in the world now where the rule of law is, you can, you know, uh, just ignore it. <laughs> so if we're going to have these leaders, and a lot of these leaders have got terrible backgrounds, as you know, if these leaders keep getting into positions of power, I mean, how can we, do you have any thoughts about how we can begin to regulate the more psychopathic amongst them? I think it's a great question. <laughs> we come back to um, the, the point about development, which is if you look at a, a two-year-old who's obviously not very developed, um, the reason you can't take a two-year-old to court is they don't understand the, the nature of uh, possession. You know, so you'll see a, you know, a little girl pinch her sister's pencil. And you go, I, I saw you. I didn't pinch it. I didn't. I just saw you take the pen. I didn't, right? Because they think everything's mine. That pen's is mine. That who's mine. That sandwich is mine. Mine, mine, mine. Because they're so egocentric, they don't understand possession. And therefore, that's why you can't take them to court. They don't know the right from the wrong. And so some of these people that ignore the law, some of them are doing it consciously and maliciously. A, a lot of people, um, it's a developmental problem. They don't really understand um, the sort of finer levels of, of maturation and morality and so on, because they simply haven't developed to that level. 
So um, often when we're working with leaders, uh, I'll often tease them and saying, look, actually, you know, leaders might be 40, 50, 60 on the outside, but on the inside, they're either eight years old or 14 years old. And that's not to be pejorative. You can actually measure that, Paul. I mean, there's a, some really interesting assessments. They're called ego uh, maturity assessments where you can quantify the inner maturity um, you know, which starts to validate some of the data I spoke about in the education book, the average reading age in the UK is nine years old. That's the average. So, you know, and if you look at the red top papers, they're pitched to an eight year old and the broadsheets are pitched to a 12 year old. So a lot of adults that you meet are not actually adults. There's been some sort of developmental, uh, you know, uh, to break and they've stopped developing on the inside, they may be knowledgeable, but they haven't matured. And so some of these terrible things that we see going on in the world is because on the inside, this 50, 60, 70 year old is still eight years old. Uh, and, and until they, first of all, wake up to that and then grow up, the problem continues. So part of what we're doing at Complete is really trying to help leaders to wake up and of course, you can't grow up unless you wake up. So there's, what's the wake up call? What helps leaders understand that there's something else going on other than the story they're telling themselves? So how do they wake up to the importance of compassion, for example? And then how do they grow up and mature to a more pro-social, more compassionate individual? So that's what we're trying to do is to help, uh, you know, humanity wake up. So do you have any pointers about how you're trying to do that? Well, the waking up, you know, it, it, data is the best way, you know, because what you'll see in fairness to a, a lot of C-suite players is they look around and, you know, they seem to be the smartest person in the room and they certainly have the most money. So in their mind, you can see there's a fairly legitimate case for saying, well, I think you'll find I'm, I'm winning here by any measure of anything. I seem to be winning. I don't need to change. I think you'll find I'm the winner here. Um, and so if you don't bring them any data, which helps sort of disrupt that view of themselves or their view of their experience, then there's no reason to change. Um, so I remember seeing a, a CEO, um, you know, a household name CEO uh, a couple of years back, and we got their biology. So as a cardiologist, I tracked their biology for 24 hours prior to seeing this, this chap. And I went to see him in his office and he spent the first 10 minutes you know, in a fairly, uh, you know, entertaining ego flourish, telling me what a genius he was. And this went on for about 10 minutes, you know, including talking about himself in the third person, which is always slightly worrying. Um, so he gave me 10 minutes, and I just had it burn out. So he was just telling me he was God's gift to this and blah, 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 and all his people loved him and so on. Um, and uh, I said, well, look, let's just assume all of that's true. Um, I'm not going to dispute any of that. Uh, I'm just, let's assume it's correct that you are God's gift to, you know, the corporate world. Um, I've only really got one question, if all of that's true. And he said, what's that? I said, if you're such a genius, why is your data third centile? I 97% of my database has got better biology than you. Why, why is that the case if you're such a genius? And it literally stopped him in his tracks because he didn't have an answer to that. So the world that he saw, he was missing this bit of data, which is basically the light was blinking red, that he was about to hit the buffers, and he had no idea that that was about to happen. So I brought him this data, and that was his wake-up call. So suddenly, all of his bullshit sort of faded away, and we had a real honest conversation about why was he about to run out of steam and run out of energy, um, and what needed to be done about that. So... The wake up call is we've built a number of these sort of tools and assessments to try and help people understand, you know, where are they really, rather than, you know, perpetuate their, you know, ego inflated narrative um, and uh, try and help them see that not only the world is slightly different from what they are seeing, but actually, if they want to discover what they're truly capable of, there are um, so from an ego development level, a lot of these players are operating at level five of 12. And when you tell them that, suddenly there's a curiosity. Well, you know, because they thought they were at the top of the tree pool. You know, you go, well, you're at five of 12. And what are those other, you know, then, you know, kind of almost using their desire to be the top dog 
as a mechanism for helping them to wake up to there are other realities, other ways of understanding yourself and other people and reality that you haven't quite unlocked yet. So unlocking these levels, so even the understanding of compassion, as you and I have talked about, is itself developmentally constrained. So a six-year-old's understanding of compassion is not the same as a 60-year-old's understanding of compassion. You know, it's, you know, what level of sophistication are you operating from and what's the next level? So that's the way that we approach is to try and help people unlock this untapped potential that exists in all of us. Um, and when one does that, you know, you do become naturally more compassionate. You do start to understand that the separation that we experience between ourselves and others is a bit of an illusion. Uh, and stuff starts to come online as you open up these new levels that you weren't even aware of at the previous level. Uh, it just kicks in. So the way out of the conundrum, as we see it, is to help people, you know, uh, unlock these levels or grow up. Yeah, that's amazing. That's fascinating. And um, of course, there's a big also now, you talk about the we-ness and interconnectedness and so forth, but people are beginning to wake up to the idea of that, you know, and this is, again, in your area, because you know Ken Wilbur, of course, um, actually, this biological uh, bodies and brain may not be all that there is to consciousness consciousness may be something rather different uh, and it certainly doesn't uh, enjoy capitalism particularly um, and getting people to have these sort of more transcendent experiences uh, some people say you know using the psychedelics can be helpful and so forth but also to helping people wake up to a reality that actually this is maybe quite a temporary place and there may well be other types of reality and and so on is is that a part of your something you're interested in and pursuing well, I mean, it's coaching so those that want to go there um you know we'll take them there i mean i've spent recently i calculated one hundred and ten thousand hours so basically obsessed my entire life for uh about you know these types of experiences and you know what it takes to unlock our full potential um you know so and as you say one can do it through micro dosing but you don't have to you can unlock this without drugs um if you understand you know there's a for example there's something called voice dialogue or a pointing out instruction so in our advanced coaching uh, i can say look in about two and a half hours i can give you a first-hand experience of what the buddha felt under the bodhi tree when he achieved enlightenment i can talk you into it eyes open it's not a meditation I can talk you into that and you'll have that first-hand experience and you know it can be really transformative uh some people um there are these other levels of consciousness these other states of consciousness that if you're interested uh we can we can go there um i don't mean you and i i mean like the client i'm talking to um but it is very fascinating um I mean, as a neuroscientist sometimes i'll you know with, with the corporate leaders obsession with pace and intensity i'll say look um i can tell you how to speed your brain up i can tell you how to think three times faster than you've ever thought in your entire life um and so it's like a wake up it's like dropping these little seeds of there is more to this than maybe you've already perceived i mean i was talking to a client last week about uh, over the last month i've flown to manila to to work with a client over there then i was in france and amsterdam and in america all within the space of three weeks so swung in both directions a seven hour with no jet lag i said look you can alter the way that your brain or your consciousness processes time so you can do these big international flights zero jet lag so it's trying to get them to understand is that there are different realities different ways even in your kind of you know, we've got to do quarterly performance and we've got to do the shareholder returns and the AGM and all of that. Even in that type of life, you can really open up other dimensions of your own capability. Um, and these are all sort of conduits to a different understanding of, you know, what it means to be a human being uh, here right now. Yeah, so that's brilliant. So you got the, all these different levels by which you can help leaders become, as you say, more mature in terms of understanding things. Uh, about the nature of the business and taking an interest in the help of others but there are these other techniques which are becoming more uh available now people actually saying there's a lot more to your mind than you think right you're not just this frontal cortex whizzing around trying to make money um 
And those kinds of insights and understandings, I think, are gradually filtering through. And it's fascinating to hear that you are also beginning to incorporate, perhaps not beginning, but you've been doing it for a while, incorporate those kinds of ways of helping people get an insight into different dimensions of what it is to be have consciousness. Yes, we're definitely doing that. Uh, and we try to sort of demystify it. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I'm essentially a scientist at heart. Um, so really schooled in the nature of data and what works. Um, and, uh, you know, often I'll, you know, I've read all these thousands of books on leadership and, and human consciousness and all of those things. And, you know, trying to distill it down to some non-denominational simple things that people can do every day that can truly transform experience as a human being. And a, a big part of that uh, is this understanding of non-separation, um, you know, and, and therefore in many ways, that's a route to a more compassionate self and, <laughs> self and others is, you know, one of the reasons we may be uh, unpleasant to other people is, is we think they're separate from us. So there's this sort of lovely metaphor uh, uh, of the hand, you know, where if uh, I, you know, see myself as this thumb, I look across the divide and see you as this finger separate from me, the thumb. Um, and so you look back and see yourself as separate from me. But of course, we don't realize we're both connected at the hand. Once we kind of understand that, uh, you know, that's why Mahalo, you know, as the Hawaiian would say, um, it's this sense of non-separation. Why would I seek an excessive competitive advantage why would I seek, why would the thumb seek to damage the finger? Because it then damages the hand. So when we understand this, it's a, a smaller step to take a more compassionate view towards the other because we are um, connected. And so that understanding of non-separation, that understanding of connection can have a profound difference to how you orientate to yourself, to everybody around you, to, certainly to your staff and your customers. That's, but I've never seen that one. I like that one. I'm going to use that one. I've never seen that one before. That's fantastic. Yeah, so I think this is, I mean, what's interesting, I think, about coming to compassionate leadership is this understanding that there are so many different ways in which we can think about compassion, but also which we can experience compassion. And the point that you're making is an important one because, yeah, you can experience compassion by, you know, developing your vagal nerve and oxytocin and all the rest of it. But some of that is bounded, you know, because we know oxytocin is is a it's not really a love hormone because it'll make you more aggressive to outsiders and, you know, and so on and so on. But when you have this other dimension, which isn't dependent upon oxytocin and frontal cortex and vagal nerve, which is this ability to have this sense of interconnectedness of consciousness itself, that's a very different game. And right. as you say, that's a very different entry into compassion and helping leaders beginning to get some sense of that. I think it's important. It's not just about training the Vegas nerve. It is actually helping them to see that as leaders, they need to have a little bit more insight about what it is to be a conscious being. Yeah, and, and exactly, because it's responsibility. I mean, you know, thousands of people <laughs> up to you um, and they want to see. I mean, people want to see an inspiring, not exhausted, angry, frustrated individual. They want to see somebody inspiring who has more insight, you know, who can see a bigger picture. And of course, you know, we have a crisis of leadership on the planet, um, which is partly why I left medicine to say, well, look, actually, uh, if we don't get better quality leadership um, in our, you know, our main power system on the planet, which is big business, I honestly think um, big business is the only mechanism that can save the future of humanity uh, because it's transnational governments take a national view so they'll often try and privilege their citizens at the expense of other citizens uh, you know so they see themselves as separate uh, whereas business is transnational um, so they have to take a broader view um, and also it's pretty pragmatic you know things have to produce some positive return um, you know and of course the obsession is about financial return as I said but actually a return as people wake up to there's a social value uh, uh, in addition to a financial value. Um, I mean, I was just talking to the CEO of this large Philippines company, literally just a few minutes ago. Um, and they're a family-run business, and they genuinely care about lifting 
you know, the Philippine society. Um, but uh, it's not understood by the community. They're seen as elitist, which isn't really true, even though they're, you know, significant and obviously as a family, um, very rich, but they genuinely care about lifting society. Um, so, you know, if we can cultivate more of that um, uh, through business rather than government, I think business is the way that uh, we're going to get an, an understanding, a more compassionate understanding of this sort of non-separation, uh, then I think we've got half a chance. Um, and, and it's quite urgent if you look at climate change or any of the other wicked problems in the world. There, we've created many, many problems uh, for ourselves, affordable health care, criminal justice, education, which I just wrote about, uh, politics. You know, a lot of these complex systems aren't really working very well. Um, and so, you know, actually, I think another thing that business has to contribute is to provide some leadership in the world. Um, and so, again, that's why, you know, I get out of bed every day and see if we can help with that. Yes, and that reminds me because you you've got a lot of um, had some interesting ideas about this idea of wicked problems because of the nature of four levels of of a wicked problem and so on and so on. I mean, it, it, it's such an important way of thinking, isn't it? These ideas of the well, how these problems become so difficult to solve because they sort of feed back in on themselves. So, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, do you feel that leaders are beginning to understand this interconnectedness? That you know, businesses itself and interconnected pursuits and so on. Well, I think they're beginning to understand it's got more complicated than they first thought, <laughs> and it's getting more complex. You know, the, the sort of Moore's law and the exponential nature of change. Um, you know, things are speeding up and up, and pretty much every business is struggling with that pace of change and that increase in complexity, uh, and that's often driving them to you know wonder about other ways of dealing because. You know, the smart ones have realized working hard and harder is not the answer. And so it's creating a greater receptivity of that. Well, what other ways could I approach this? In, in, you know, how else could I do this? You know, because just flogging myself to, to frustration and heart attack that you talked about earlier is clearly not the answer. Um, and so in that struggle and that pain, um, there's a certain amount of receptivity. So one of the books I wrote was about the nature of change uh, called Step Change, you know, the four phases, 12 steps of change. And of course, step two is challenge the reality of the wake up call or the pain. So sadly, you know, most people don't change unless they're in some degree of discomfort. Um, but as Joseph Campbell said, um, you know, that moment of pain is really a call to adventure. Um, now, a lot of people, when they're feeling the pain, they don't realize it's the call to adventure. <laughs> they're just in pain, so they'll anesthetize with drugs and alcohol, distractions of various sorts. Um, but if you can lean into that, then actually it's a stimulus for change, for doing something different in order to get out of that pain. So most people, uh, if they you know, keep self-dosing you know, with drugs and alcohol or distraction, at some point, hopefully, they, the penny drops is none of that really solves the problem. So, you know, you can get wasted or drugged out, but it doesn't solve the problem. When you recover from your hangover, your drug overdose, the problem's still there. It solves nothing, really. Um, and then, uh, neither does the distraction. So eventually, you have to change yourself. That's the nature of it. And so, you know, increasingly, people beginning to realize that this you know, maybe testosterone fueled macho, immature stance of, you know, self benefit over other benefit actually isn't delivering. So maybe I need to, you know, change the way I think about myself and other people. So, you know, as the world speeds up, gets more complicated, more problems, you know, then the increase in pain that that creates, paradoxically, uh, is spawning you know, uh, an increasing number of people waking up and breaking through to a different way of thinking. Yes, I mean, that is absolutely the essential element, isn't it, of waking up and breaking through to a different level of thinking and experiencing the world, really. And I think that's, you know, the work that you do is a major contributor to that. Um, so we've talked quite a lot about, <clears throat> you know, how you got into it interested leader and all the different dimensions that you've been involved with 
in helping leaders all the way through the practical, all the way through to the more, you know, conscious based, waking up to the reality of what it is to be a conscious being. So, you know, we're coming to the end now of, uh, you know, it's been a fascinating hour. Um, what do you see as the challenges for you personally and the challenges for us in bringing compassionate leadership, uh, more compassionate leadership into the world? <clears throat> I think to me personally, Paul, it's, um, you know, the maintenance of the desire to continue to help. Uh, because as I said earlier on, it, you know, we've been at it 20 years this year, uh, you know, working in the business, my wife and I, trying to get the message out that, that actually, you know, there is a more compassionate way of proceeding. Uh, and so at a personal level, um, you know, we're not getting any younger. And so to keep at it. Um, and so, you know, one one's often nourished by those little victories uh, on a weekly basis where clients light goes on even if momentarily and they go oh you know maybe you know uh, but of course we still meet plenty of leaders who are totally locked into their EBITDA and their quarterly profits and their cost cutting and all of that um, so at a personal level you know maintaining the passion for the mission um, you know, becomes tricky um, uh, but I think from a work level um, you know, having gone for 20 years and tested all these things to help people wake up and grow up, we're pretty uh, convinced that they actually do help individuals wake up and grow up and discover their own potential and this fascinating journey uh, of, you know, what's possible for themselves. Um, so now the business is in a pivot point where we think, well, we've really tested it for 20 years. Now we want to try and uh, go from the 20 coaches that work to, uh, for us to a thousand, you know, oh, so wow. building a coaching school, mm -hmm. 28,000 coaches in the UK, and most of them have not been trained in any of this sort of thinking. Um, you know, they're just, you know, sometimes some of them have got no training at all. They just open up shop. Uh, so it's a non-regulated market. Um, and so partly what we want to do is go into more of a distribution, there are some incredible things that one can do, relatively simple things that can transform your life relatively quickly. And so, you know, moving forward uh, is to try and get this information uh, to a wider bunch of uh, people who, you know, are in that role of trying to help others, uh, whether it's coaches, therapists, you know, facilitators, um, teachers, uh, you know, the education book and so on. Um, is get this knowledge and understanding. It's not as widespread as it needs to be, which is why a lot of these problems continue. Um, if people discover this stuff, they can change their life. Uh, Karen O'Brien, who's, who's a colleague on the climate change, that wrote a very interesting book called You Matter More Than You Think. A lot of people live with this idea that, uh, well, little old me, what can I do? Uh, well, as she says, you matter more than you think. You can create ripples. Uh, and if everybody starts to become the pebble in the pond and create ripples, then the world starts to change. Um, so um, that's where we're at in the business is trying to get out to a wider audience. Some of these things you can do to have more compassion for yourself, more compassion for others, and basically live a better life, be a better human being, enjoy more fulfillment, more joy, all of those types of things. Um, and so you know, I've got this balance between the excitement of trying to get, you know, these skills out in the world and share them a bit more, and also 20 years of, you know, still encountering some of the sort of very significant resistance in the corporate sector. So that's roughly where I am as of right now today, Paul. That's, that's very good. And at some point, um, to persuade you to think, if I, we don't need to persuade you, but, you know, what are we going to do with our political leaders? Because as you know, you know, we've seen what's happened in the last 10, 15 years. I mean, the how services have been run into the ground, all the services have been run into the ground. You know, we have to say that we have a lot of callous people get into positions of power. Yeah. And uh, they they really don't care. And um, if they're further up, you go in the big businesses, the fossil fuel industries are all the same. They they're completely cut off from any concern with helping other other individuals they they don't set out to be harmful they're not cruel but they just don't twig it you know so it's really 
how as a society we have more uh we demand more of our leaders we demand more compassionate leaders uh not ones that can speak to the right wing press or something so that i think is also something that i find very interesting in how do we make populations more compassionate and aware populations more demanding of those people who will lead them uh, and not be manipulated into this tribal uh, offensive nonsense <laughs> yeah well i think we're going to get the story out um more widely and actually you know tell a, a positive you know th this is where joy and fulfillment mm. and the things that are available to any of us this is where that actually exists i mean i coach you know quite a few billionaires and a lot of them are pretty miserable yeah uh, you know and so um but they're trapped in this system you know with this immaturity inside of them in a brainwashed view of reality that they often don't realize that that's what they're operating with um and so you know that's kind of in many ways what's kept me going um and i think if we can uh help people unlock some of that within their own life uh, and each of those people become an agent of change themselves, then ripples could become ripples and ripples. And I think that's uh, two mechanisms of shifting uh, society, that grassroots rippling, but also in our, the work we do as a, as a business is that top down into the power structures. If you can wake up enough of these leaders, and uh, um, we're certainly not able to wake up all of them, but if you can wake up enough of them and start to create that shift uh, then I think we have a chance, uh, uh, a chance not only of resolving a lot of these wicked issues, education, criminal justice, affordable health care, climate change, all, all of these things that we've made a mess of, um, then humanity has half a chance. But without that, you know, getting to those guys who still have the power and the grassroots, then, you know, the future looks bleak for humanity. But I'm still an optimist. Um, you know, I think the main cause of optimism, despite all the uh, stuff that you describe in the world, which I agree with, I'm still an optimist because largely the pace of change is so significant and rapid when it happens. The question is, will it happen early enough to save the future of humanity? And I think that it's finally balanced right at this point. Um, but I still remain optimistic. You know, I mean, why not? I mean, I could be a pessimist, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, so you have to be optimistic, I think. I mean, I generally am optimistic. You have to be optimistic that actually it will change in time. Yes, yes. And uh, the point, we didn't get into it too much, but the point that you made about, about AI, it's going to be radical. It's going to be radical for business. You know, business will not be as it is, you know, 50 years from now. And there's a whole lot of issues about, you know, what will people do for work? What will they do for making a claim on resources and so on and so on. So those are huge, huge issues for, um, you know, business leaders and political leaders. AI is one of the greatest challenges to the way we live, you know. But maybe I mean, it's for book 12. I'm just starting the planning with that one. Uh, because again, it's very interesting on the AI front, people telling this Armageddon story because they've seen Skynet and the Terminator and all yeah. of that. <laughs> And a lot of uh, commentators are telling that story. You know, AI is going to take over. It's going to kill all jobs. It's going to even kill all of humanity and so on. I actually have a different view to that is I'm, again, optimistic that um, one can create a... I mean, AI is us. I mean, we're the builders of AI. So it's nothing separate from us. So if we understand what we're building and, you know, we're mature... If you've got white supremacists doing the coding, you shouldn't be surprised if you get white supremacist code. But if you've got the Dalai Lama doing the coding, you get a different sort of code. So if we can grow up, we create different AI. And actually, you know, the book I'm uh, about to start writing is the synergy between human development and AI development um, and how it helps each other. Uh, so that's the story that I'm about to write about in book 12. But I think that's a wonderful point to finish on because what it says is really AI, it's all about motivation. If your motivation is compassionate to live, to be helpful, to help to be helpful to humanity, it's going to be great. If it's all about competitiveness and how to screw everybody else apart from your own business or something, it is not going to be so helpful. So I think that's where we leave it, isn't it? Motivation is the key to everything. Compassion and motivation, live to be helpful, not harmful. 
Alan, it's been a delight talking with you and um, look forward to talking to you again in the future. And good luck with your new book. I shall look forward to reading it on your thoughts on AI because you've always got wonderful thoughts and all kinds of things. So thank you so much for being part of a Create a Compassionate World series. Thank you for having me on, Paul. Pleasure.